Thank you very much. Am I still getting enough audio at the back? Okay, awesome. Um, I was born in Queensland, I might have you know. <laughs> so. Okay, so I'm going to talk about 30 um, WordPress audits that I did in 30 days and the kind of lessons that I've learned. But before we get into that, I want to find out a little bit about you guys. So who in the room have been exposed to WordPress for less than one year? Wow. It's a good mix there. How about uh, one to five years? Okay, how about more than five years? Okay, have a look around. These are all the people that got trapped here because there's only one track. <laughs> <laughs> the advanced session's not open yet and they didn't get to the door in time before I started, so... <laughs> no, now there's more pressure on me to get the facts straight than before. <laughs> So bear with me. Okay. I'm Tony Cosentini, as you know. The wpguy.com.au is where you can find me. Same with Instagram. It's a little tip. You could use your website address as your Instagram name with the dots and everything. Makes it super easy. Uh, Facebook's the WP Guy. Right. So a little bit of a walkthrough of uh, my timeline. So in 2008, uh, I started an internet communications degree and blogging I think was a subject and WordPress came up. You had to go and find WordPress and install it and um, at the same time I had a, um, I think a friend of a, my sister that needed a website for their hairdressing salon and I thought I think I could use WordPress to kind of do this so I just had a go at setting them up and they loved it. and. That kind of sparked the beginning of building websites for money. <laughs> so I was, I don't know, fun start. So 2011, uh, I decided to ramp it up and I went, got on a plane and went to New Zealand to my first WordCamp and it was just mind blowing. Like I had um, people who worked for Automatic there. There were people that uh, built plugins there that I'd actually heard of. Um, and this great regular community of people as well that were just all, you know, amazing. So enjoy, thoroughly soaked it up and enjoyed it and then came back to Australia and then went to another WordCamp that same year in Melbourne. And I got up and did a, a lightning talk on my five favourite plugins. So if you get a chance to do a lightning talk, I suggest you have a go at that too. It's a lot of fun and there's no pressure. You can just get up and talk. Um, and then in 2012, I decided to speak uh, at... Sydney WordCamp about uh, every plugin under the sun that I'd kind of come across and it was a shocker. <laughs> I'm still getting over that presentation. If, please don't go and look at it. It's somewhere online still. Um, but because of that, I, I, I didn't really get back to doing speaking until last year. I had a lot of post-traumatic stress from that, <laughs> that last one. <laughs> so, but I came back here last year and spoke about podcasting using WordPress and um, I've got some nice feedback and Charlie sitting right here enjoyed it, I believe. Say hi Charlie. Hi. <laughs> um, so here we are today talking about the, the lessons I've learnt while doing ordering 30 WordPress websites in 30 days. Right. Something I love about WordPress though, just, just to um, inspire anyone that's just new to WordPress is it can give you a lot of things like freedom, flexibility, financial security, um, trying to be a great dad for my kids. The, the guy on the top left is my oldest and he was on Australia's Got Talent on Sunday. It's Magic Josh, or Hot Josh, got a nickname, and he's, he's going to be on again tomorrow night in the semi-finals and you may see a cameo appearance from my mohawk. I don't know yet, <laughs> but I was there. <laughs> Okay, and you get to meet some amazing people in the WordPress community, particularly this lovely lady, who will be speaking later with opening and closing WordCamp for you today. Right, so here's 30 common mistakes that are worth noting. Right, the number, I think the number one thing you can do to make your website terrible is get cheap hosting. You think you're going to save money, you're just starting up, you look for the $5 a month hosting and you find it 
and you start to grow and then you realise that um, your email's not working, your site's super slow, it's, sometimes it goes offline, you can't get hold of any WordPress, any support staff. Um, I really suggest thinking strongly about your hosting. It's, and you, later we'll talk about speed, but hosting's where you can actually um, improve your speed the most, getting decent hosting. The more, host, the more people on a hosting account, cheap hosting, the more people that are fighting for the same server processing speed and um, there's lots of great hosting options outside, some of which I've you, I use, so talk to them. Now, when I, when I was auditing these sites, there's a lot of people that had um, the default time zone set in their settings. It's under the general settings, I think. Um, and you can, you can select not only, you know, plus 10 for Brisbane, but you could select your city so that if you're in a, a state that has daylight savings, it will automatically adjust to the uh, daylight savings time. It's kind of important to know when comments come through, when you want to post something ahead of, like, schedule a post that it comes out at the right time. So that's just an easy one to get right that people often miss. Your permalip settings. Um, I still found a few websites that had the, de the old default WordPress permalink setting. And the question mark peak was one, two, three. It doesn't roll off the tongue when trying to share a link to somebody. Um, now, my favourite is post name, but I know that people that, that build uh, silos of content prefer to have category and then post name, which is also a good strategy and it doesn't affect standard pages still come up as their page name. And if you've got if you're really making a category as your blocks of content that you want to promote, then you can use category post name as well. Okay. Um, how many people know about this setting? How many people have never heard of this, this discouraged search engines from indexing your site? Anyone not heard of it? Good. Um, I've, I've looked at websites someone paid $30,000 for three months previously, and that setting was still set to discourage search engines. <laughs> it's so easy to miss, because when you're building a site, you want to hide it from Google at the time, and uh, if it gets forgotten, to switch back. Right. Hello Dolly is a great plugin to show you how plugins are structured. Uh, but, and I think Matt Mullenweg actually his name's on it. I don't know whether he wrote, wrote it, but it, it doesn't need to be there, right? It's just a plugin that's sitting there doing nothing that you can delete, right, to tighten up your, um, your plugins. And, and, and honestly, I found probably about 25% of the websites still had it sitting there. Um, too many plugins, right? So the opening comments were that I, one of the websites I came across had 100 plugins. It really did have 100 plugins. The scariest part was only 50 of them were active. <laughs> so, so there were like 100 attack vectors for hackers to kind of look for weak points to get into the website. So have a real think about what plugins you use. Um, and there's lots of options too. Anyway, the, like some themes have options that you didn't realise that can replace a plugin. Um, and I know we're going to probably talk about Gutenberg today, but if you've got a Visual Builder um, theme and, and you, you kind of want to switch off the Gutenberg blocks to sort of let you just use that Visual Builder tool in that, um, for building your content, a lot of them now have introduced uh, a setting which you can enter classic editor mode automatically without needing the, the plugin that you can get to do that. So there's little things you can do to kind of um, streamline your plugin collection. Right, so back to that 50 inactive plugins that, that that website had. If you've got inactive plugins, don't be a hoarder, right? Don't, don't, you don't have to, I know they're, they're really, really handy, you never know when you might need it, but if they're in the plugin directory, you can install it, you can search for it, install it down the track when you need it. Don't just have it sitting there just in case on a rainy day you might want it. Right, um, old themes was a really common one t to have every default WordPress theme since the website was um, built. 
you don't need to have every version of WordPress, the WordPress theme sitting in there, or themes that you've tried and decided that you've, you, you're going with a particular one. Um, have one theme as a fallback, so you can deactivate your main theme if you have real issues to, to try and fault find. So 2019, I'd suggest having that because it's the most current, um, less chance of having, having bugs and issues and things. So don't have a theme graved out in your website. Child themes. How many people don't have a child theme on their website? It's not too bad. I know that the case now is that you can use custom CSS and you don't need to have a child theme, but one day you might want to add some functions to the website and there's also plugins for that, but it's kind of cleaner to have a child theme to add custom CSS to, uh, to add functions. And there's a couple of um, plugins that are really good to do that. There's um, Child Theme Wizard, which you can use to create a child theme. My favourite is the Child Theme Configurator at the moment, um, because it will analyse the theme that you want to make a child theme from, and it will tell you whether it's compatible with making a child theme, and it will also copy your things like your menu and footer settings across to the child theme, so you don't have to go and reallocate the main menu, stuff like that, worth thinking about. Right, so I couldn't believe it. These websites, were serious websites that I looked at that were commercial for commercial use and that, they were definitely a, um, a revenue generator and a lot didn't have backup running. They either uh, had no backup plugin installed whatsoever or they had it installed and they had one backup for when their website was built and nothing since. You need to do regular backups, um, preferably on a weekly basis, but it really depends if you don't move your content around, don't change your content. Depends when you do updates and when you do um, content updates and plugin updates and things like that. So have a regular update uh, schedule and there's plenty of um, options out there. My favourite at the moment is WP Updraft Plus. It's a free plug-in on the WordPress.org repository. It allows scheduling, it allows off-site backup so you can send copies of the backup to um, Amazon S3, which is my favourite off-site uh, off storage option. Take, there's a little bit of pain initially to set that up, but it's worth it, it's very economical. You, you can use Dropbox, I think Dropbox has funny things happen once you get over a certain size though, so I've found uh, Amazon S3 the most reliable. Right. No security. Now, I know people who start out think, why would anyone care about my website? It's just starting up, it's, it's nothing, it's, well, there's no reason to come and hack my site. But I've had sites that were quite new and they were hacked and they were, a South African bank was set up in place of them. Because a soft site is easy to use by hackers to um, use for other things, phishing, um, things like that. So if you make your site slightly harder to access than the next WordPress site, then they'll just move on to the softer targets and you'll avoid the trouble. So um, WordFence is a popular plugin for that. I really like uh, WP All-in-One Security, I think it's called. It's kind of lighter, a bit lighter, uh, but still quite effective. Right. So, caching. If, you've, uh, if you're a programmer and you can custom make all the code for your theme from the ground up, you probably have a very slick, fast site. You probably don't even think about caching, but these days we're using lots of tools, themes with visual editors and lots of these 50 plugins. Um, so caching can save you a lot of grief and there's plenty of options around. There's, pay, there's free options, there's paid options. Um, you just search for WordPress caching that you'll find them. There's, there's a number of them out there, but it's worth, it's, it's one of the foundation things you should consider having on every site. Contact forms. I'm sure everyone here's got a contact form. How many people have contact forms? How many people don't have contact forms that do not save entries? No one's going to put their hand up. Oh. The issue is you've 
created a website, you've done marketing, people have come to, found you, they've come to your website, they've looked at your site, they said, yes, I think I do want to uh, work with this person. They go to your contact form, they go, go to the trouble of filling it in, they hit send, and then after that point, things happen. Websites often lose an email on the way out. There can be an issue with the mail exchanger of the hosting or a setting that doesn't work. Uh, your email account might have a problem. There's so many factors that can lose that email between the send and your inbox. And you've just lost this critical um, lead when if you, if you allow your website to save copies of the uh, forms, at least you've got a fallback. You can go back on a regular basis and go, oh, the form. And I've seen, <laughs> I've seen it happen. This happen when a percentage of emails have just not made it out. So obviously Gravity Forms is a, is a plugin that everyone's heard of. It's a paid uh, option, but the, you can find some of the free plugins out there that have add-ons that will um, make them save copies in the database. So do some research and have a look for those. If you're not up for paying for a, a, a paid tool, I think you can leverage free tools if you write, combine a, a standard contact plugin with a um, an add-on that creates database entries. Okay, on your form, you need to also think about how many fields you're making the person fill in. Too many fields, as it says there, reduces the completion rate by 50% every field you add. You want to ask them, I don't know, uh, how they found you is probably an important one to have, but there's other questions that you may want to avoid. I have a short contact form for the initial contact, and then I've got longer forms for different tasks. So if someone wants a website built, I'll send them a different, to a different form that has much more detail, because we've already started the conversation and they're prepared for it. They're prepared to take some more time. But the initial contact, we're trying to get that initial spark, keep it, keep it as easy as possible for them. Slow sites. Now, I can remember being in, being in a talk when I think it was seven seconds. Three seconds is the new seven seconds. So if you want to talk about how fast your site is, you're aiming for three seconds. Now, I would literally watch my site go from six seconds to three seconds just by changing hosting. They were both hosted in Australia, but the new option was just the Rolls Royce of hosting, which are outside today. Uh, okay, images. <clears throat> now this is again talking about the speed situation. It was very common when I was looking at these sites to find um, thousand pixel images sitting in 250 pixel boxes ar around the page. Right, so it's d think about that. Think, of, Try and work out, with Google Chrome you can right click and get um, image sizes off the, off the page and just see what size the, pay, the images are being rendered and then create an image that size and that's step one. Then the file size of those images is still normally bigger than it should be. Um, oh, by the way, the three second rule on the previous slide, tiny, uh, um, pingdom.com is where you can benchmark how fast your website is. That's a good place to do speed checks. So back to the images. So, um, what tinypng.com is a great service that's free. You can click and drag 10 or 20 images up to there at once, and it will reduce them down to the minimum file size, whether they're PNGs or JPEGs, without um, losing any quality. So it'll give you the most efficient image you can get, um, and that will help your page load speed, so we're aiming to get this three seconds kind of going. How many people here use Yoast for SEO as an SEO tool? How many people here use something else? Okay. So there's a percentage, and I respect that. I used to use other SEO plugins too. But it's, it's kind of the common uh, SEO tool these days. So if you haven't got one, I'd seriously recommend having a look at it. It's free. It's uh, well supported. There's lots of people that know about how to use it. But the next step, is don't leave it in the default setup. 
because it generates sitemaps for things that you don't necessarily need, like not every website wants authors to be in a site, a, a group of, um, that's indexed by Google, or sometimes images. Projects is a very common um, tool that is part of um, a lot of themes these days, and people aren't using them anyway, so there's no point creating a sitemap or letting Google try and index something called projects when it's not there. So, and also your social media accounts. I found a lot of sites that had Yoast installed hadn't put their social media accounts into the setting for social in the Yoast settings. So that's worth considering too. Uh, analytics, it's a really important thing to do. And you might think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get the website built and then I'll, I'll get to the analytics. And I, I've actually had a, quite a few people who didn't have analytics set up because they thought they were still on an early stage, but really you want your data from day one if you can to show the growth and to see who came to your website in the beginning and then how it's evolved and you, you need to know. If you don't know what traffic's come to your site, what are you going to, um, how are you going to you know, grow your business? You need to know these things. So get, get Google Analytics set up. And then I'd say about 90% of the sites that I looked at, their Google Analytics account even though they'd moved to HTTPS, they had not changed their Google Analytics property settings to HTTPS. So I bet you there's at least more than 50% of the people here with the, in that scenario. So common. SSL certificates. I'm trying to think of when, how, how many years ago that, we re that the pendulum really swung towards um, HTTPS, I think it's, it's just so the norm now. And you'll find if you, if you are still running on HTTP that your web hosting is probably providing you with a free uh, SSL certificate through Let's Encrypt or something like that. And it could even, in a lot of cases when I looked at the websites, it was already active and they, you just needed to then change your settings to HTTPS and there's some other steps you need to do to go and find references to HTTP. Um, but it's not impossible to do, it's worth, it's worth doing. Because you'll get left behind. 95% of the websites had HTTPS. Okay. Google Search Console was often missed. Often people were happy to have Google Analytics set up. Um, they had their WordPress logins, but they didn't have, a Google, have Google Search Console set up. If you can take the time to do it with using DNS settings, because Google, Google has allowed you to do this now. It captures all of the variations of your, your website, whether there's www and it, HTTPS and all that sort of stuff. The um, domain level is the best way to do it. And then once you've got it set up, I found a lot of the sites had installed Yoast and they hadn't um, submitted the Yoast um, sitemap to, the, uh, to Google Search Console. So remember to do that to, um, in, the, in the Yoast settings, there is an area, I think it, it's, it's, it's when it lists all the features that you, you've got in Yoast. There's a section that says sitemap XML and there's, it, you, you literally can click on a link which will show you the sitemap reference and then get that and put that into your Google Search Console. Make sure that your admin email address is the one that you want to get regular updates from Google Search Console. I think usually it's turned on to send you updates, but check that it um, is turned on and check that you've got the right email address connected because a lot of you will use a Gmail address to set up Google Search Console because it's quick and easy, but now you can connect your regular business email address to um, Google and then add that as an email account as well so that you, it's in your main inbox so you don't miss it because you don't always check your Gmail as much as your, your commercial, your business email. Right, um, H1s, we're getting onto the content area now. H1s commonly were used to make statements down the page because they liked the fact that the H1s were nice and big and bold. But from a content perspective, it's kind of confusing. You don't, you don't write an essay and say, my essay is about this, and then 
halfway down you put another heading of the same magnitude as the first one about a, really a subheading. So think about that. Apparently it's not as, John Mueller says that it's not as important to you Google juice as it used to be, but it's still good practice. Use CSS to adjust your H2 settings to um, be larger if you want to use prominent headings. And I found that commonly. And some uh, themes actually, for some bizarre reason, their comment heading was H1 by default. So you've got to look at your theme and sometimes there's issues with that, that which you would then use the child theme that I mentioned to fix. You can, you can sort out issues like that with your child theme. Uh, how many people's phone numbers are click to call? How many people's phone numbers are not click to call on their website? Right. So we've, we've entered the mobile first era. It's, it's so common now. It's painful to try and click on that number, select the exact amount of text, go into your phone app and paste it in. And you know, when you really just want to push that number and go to your phone calling section. And all you have to do is put T-E-L colon and then the number. Just like you do with an A-H, a normal link, except instead of HTTPS, you put T-E-L. If you want to have spaces in the way that the number is displayed on the phone, put dashes in between. If you put an actual space in those numbers, I think you'll have an issue. Or put the whole number in as um, one continuous number. It's a re it was so common, like so common on the websites that I looked at. And, you know, it's slowing people down. It's, it's not making it as easy to get hold of you. Okay, so how many people have got e-commerce sites? Yep. Think about whether you've got terms and conditions and terms of service on your website, because I think it's Australian law that you're meant to. <laughs> Take, so, and a lot of clients that I looked at didn't have that. So you're kind of flying blind, you're kind of breaking some rules. Um, there's, there's plenty of services out there to help you do that. WordPress has got um, some templates to help you do your privacy settings. So think about that from a commercial perspective. Basic architecture. Now, I guess it's, t it's kind of, everyone's got an opinion about this, but don't, don't get creative with your, with your navigation. It's meant to be boring. It's meant to be easy to get to. It's meant to get, get people to where they need to go. Don't say, um, ask, us, ask us about or something instead of contact. You know, just get to it. Cart. What's wrong with cart? What, what do we need bag now? <laughs> like, I think it's other softwares probably using it. We're trying to copy them. Let's stick to our guns. We started with cart. Um, 10 second rule. In 10 seconds, if I looked at any of your websites, would I, would I know who you were, what you do, who you do it for, and why you're better than anyone else at it? Ten, do you think you could communicate that in 10 seconds, or would you have to read for three minutes to find out that you're, I don't know, a great architect? So think about your messaging. Make it punchy. Make it happen in the 10 seconds. How many people here are not, have, do not have a Google My Business set up? You've all got Google My Business. So if I went and searched for your website right now, I'll, can, can I get your website up on, up on the screen? No, I won't do it to you. It's, you're missing an opportunity. It's a land grab right now. Hurry up and do it. People want to search for you in your locality. You're going to come up first if you've got a Google My Business page. It's like 15 minutes of your life. Do it. It's, it's so worth doing. That's 30. Um, now, I want to say this. At, at these conferences, by tomorrow, the people sitting here will be really chilled, relaxed. Um, you've, you would have got to know other people around the um, community. Um, can we have the five plus WordPress people stand up for me? Please, more than five years. These are the these are the WordPress veterans, right? And and normally at a conference, you are scared of them. And they and in other conferences, they're standoffish, hard to talk to. 
um, clicky, blah, blah, blah. Th these people are the opposite of that, right? They're friendly, they want to help you, they've got lots of knowledge they, they're, that they've built up over the, the years. Talk to them early, talk to them early. Don't wait till tonight for drinks. Talk to them today and build, start building a friendship early. That's, that's what I want to say. <coughs> Questions, anyone? <laughs> Good, we're going to keep on time. If you want to find me, here I am, the wpguy.com.au. Okay, we can have about oh. two questions because I'm Actually, conscious of the that, timing. That. Yep. Um, if you've got a question, you'd like to, we'd ideally like you to come down to the mic rather than having someone come and run to the mic. Okay. Come on down to the mic. I'll run, up, I'll run it up to them. We, we had some runners. Oh, uh, actually, that'll fix stuff up the live stream. Sorry. Yeah. Really conscious of it. Uh, you recommend Updraft Plus for uh, backups? Yeah. I use Updraft Plus and I back up on a weekly basis to Amazon S3. Yeah, yeah. The problem I have with it, it also stores the backup on the website itself. How can I avoid that? Does it, it doesn't have that setting, does it, to delete after, after sending? No, you've just got to do housekeeping. Oh, no. You can do it after, after about five. You can tell it how many backups to keep on your, on your in general, in the, on the settings page. I, do, I usually do it about 10, just in case. Yeah. And, uh, but then again, it, it, I've had 400 backups stored there at times. I think there's a setting that you, you can set how many copies it keeps yeah. in general. I, yeah, I can't work out where to put it, where to set it. It's at, the, it's at the very top when you go to settings it says do weekly, monthly, daily, whatever. Yeah. And right next to that it says how many. Yeah. And I set that, but it still stores But it still stores them? Still stores it. And then when I delete it from the website, it also deletes it from S3. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you know something about that? Cron job? If you, if you can do cron jobs, I can advise you on cron jobs. Uh, the Updraft Plus people are also really handy. So if you log a help ticket, um, they'd usually respond. They're usually about 48 hours, but they're usually quite good and they'll get back to you to help. And I've backed up sites that were unbackupable on paid backup software with WP Updraft Plus. It's so good at backing up hard sites and big sites. Particularly for remote storage, I've had issues with get, sending remote copies. Updraft Plus um, batches it really well. Yeah. Hi. Sorry, Tony. Um, yeah, so you're, um, you're sort of uh, sound like you're pretty good on Yoast SEO. Um, have you tried all-in-one SEO? And do you... That's the look. That's that's historical. That's an historical SEO tool. That, that's like one of the first ones that I used. Yeah. Um, I, I use both, and I find each has sort of. They have their own quirks. The, the thing that is, interests me, though, that is Yoast is working with Google on, on a regular basis. So they're a bit a bit more cutting edge. And yes, sometimes they do things that break, almost break the Yoast setting, the SEO settings, but they fix it pretty quickly with the automatic updates. So it's, it's, real, it's, like, it's almost like Betamax and VHS. Like it's, to me, it's like yeah, Yoast is kind of the, f the primary these days for me. There were was, there was some other ones I use as well, but yeah. Hi. Yo. Um, is there one website that comes to your mind, regardless of the industry or whatever, but something, one or two websites that come to your mind right now that you can say, people, this is what a website should be like. Hmm. Who would that be? Besides yours, Tony's got a good website if you haven't uh, seen it yet. <laughs> all in one recipe for success. All in one SEO recipe for success is one. Elegant Themes is the other. Elegantthemes.com. Hello. Um, Hi. I'm wondering, like, is there any optimal number of um, plugins that you would like to limit yourself no. in terms of inst installation? No. Because they're all different. Some are f bulky and use a lot of resources, and some are lean and don't. It doesn't matter. You could have, you could have 50 lean plugins that are really well coded, it wouldn't matter. But you could have five heavy, sluggish plugins that 
create problems. So, no, it just comes down to how good the plugin is. Look at how many downloads there are. Look at how regularly it's updated. Look at who's um, supporting that plugin, whether it's a, a lone developer who's at uni that's going to get bored in a couple of years, or whether it's, a, it's got a company behind it that are going to fund regular updates, that are prepared to kind of keep, keep check on the, the latest versions of WordPress to uh, keep it current. So it's really about the pedigree of the plugin, not the quantity. Yeah. And definitely not 100. <laughs> Well, I'm conscious of the time, so I know that Tony's going to be around in the, the, the tea breaks and the lunches and things, so he's definitely somebody that you can have a yarn to, ask questions of, uh, get onto his website and his Insta and chase him down and ask questions. And I still do those uh, health checks for not only clients but for developers. So if you want a sanity check of what you've done before you sort of send it on your way, uh, I do, it for, do that service for developers too. Yeah, and I've noticed that there is a, you can actually buy one of his health checks from his actual website. You can click and purchase. So yeah. it's, it's very handy to have a second set of eyes. So I'd like you to join Thank me you. in thanking Tony Thank for you. sharing a whole lot of the wisdom. Thank you.